Father, Lord, I'll stand this morning and do what you call me to do. But Holy One, this service is in your hands. God, we grant to thee, Heavenly Father, do whatever you want to do. Bless your sweet holy name. Heavenly Father, if you want to stop it right in the middle of my message, you go right ahead and do whatever you want to do, Lord. This is your service. This is your church. In Jesus' sweet holy name I pray. Amen. All right. If you've got your Bible, turn the book of Genesis with me this morning, please. Chapter number 45. After the evening service on on Sunday, September the 22nd, we're having an ice cream social. Please sign up on the list in the foyer to bring sandwiches, desserts, canned drinks, and homemade ice cream. Please see Vivian McFalls if you have any questions. This is the 22nd of September. All right. If you have your Bibles, the book of Genesis, chapter number 45, and verse number 25. Genesis 45, 25. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Father, bless this holy book. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. This is one of the clearest places in the Bible where you have the two natures. What God said Jacob was and what Jacob still thought he was are conflicting here before your very eyes. Jacob is the usurper, the one who stole the birthright and all that. But Israel is the prince with God. And if you notice that Jacob at first did not believe the good tidings that had been brought to him. Verse 26, he believed them not. And then when he saw, as we all see, that which is seen is not a faith. But when he saw his spirit of Jacob, not Israel, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And then the Bible said in verse 28, Israel said... He had to reach beyond his unbelief and what he saw, and it sparked something inside that he'd received at Peniel. Then Israel said, and we all know that that battle still rages to this moment inside all of us. I have Jacob in me, make no mistake about it, and I have Israel. And so we have a confrontation that takes place in the book of Isaiah. Confrontations can be a good thing, because in a confrontation... Uh, the facade is wiped away, and you begin to look deep within your soul and find out what's going on. So what we have in Genesis 45 is Jacob versus Israel. Jacob versus Israel. Jacob the usurper versus the prince of God, the one who has power with God. It is the old man versus the new man. The old man versus the new man. The old man is corrupt and decay. The new man is a new creature. The old man is alienated from God. The new man is a son of God. The old man is condemned and cursed. The new man is blessed. The old man is lost. The new man is saved. The old man is corrupt in his mind, filthy and perverted. He has a corrupt nature. It is a well that brings forth nothing but bitterness. But the new man is renewed in his mind. His senses are open to the knowledge of God. Spiritual truths flood the soul, not words on paper, but a burning sense of truth and reality in his heart. The old man is alienated from God. He's suspicious. He's full of doubt, unbelief, and denial. But the new man is infused with faith, trust, 
reliance and dependence upon the Lord, his identity begins to take hold that now he is a son of God. The old man is condemned, therefore he curses and he has bitterness. The cursed curse. The way of the transgressor is hard, pitfalls and traps. Gains the whole world, he will. He has billions upon billions, but they do him no good where he's going. The new man is blessed, divine provision. There's a way made for him. The curse is gone. Condemnation is a tactic of Satan. But he begins to understand that, and he knows that they that which are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. He begins to overcome. He understands the promise of God. And what the Word of God can convey to his heart makes all the difference in the world and eventually yields fruit and faith and rejoicing. The old man is lost. He's full of confusion, uncertainty, fear, tossed to and fro like the troubled sea. But the saved man becomes an overcomer. He rises above the obstacles to take the Word of God, to take hold of it. He prayer and communion gives him stability and security. Therefore, unlike the troubled sea, the born-again believer has a firm foundation. Jacob had a Bethel, the house of God. Jacob had a Paniel, the face of God. And Jacob had a Mahinim, the two camps of God. Bethel led to Mahinim, which led to Paniel. At Bethel, when Jacob started on his journey, it was if, 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 if. If God will do this, if God will do that, if, if, if. Many of you in this house this morning haven't passed Bethel. It's all the if. If God, if can, if He can, can God, is it possible? And He reaches out into the darkness and tries to embrace something, but He doesn't have the spiritual strength to take hold of the great promise of God. But then it leads Him to the place where the schemer, there at Mahinim, because He said His family, in two separate camps when He found out that Esau had 400 men with Him. And you know what He did to Esau? Read your Bible. He left in the worst of circumstances, so he thought that Esau was after retribution. He knew he was out to settle a score. He knew in his heart there could be no other way. My friend, it was no trust in God. He separated them, split one on one side, one on the other, and said, Peradventure, if they get this, at least this is left. And so the two camps would be united because he did wind up at Peniel. And it was at Peniel that he wrestled with God. He wrestled with the angel. It was there all night long that the old Jacob and the new Israel would be born. It was there that he came face to face with a lifetime of doubt and deceit and usurpation. It was a lifetime of lies and deceit. It was what he came from. It was his heritage. But something had to be done to change Jacob. And the only one that can change is God Almighty. The only one that can change the nature of man is the Lord God. It must come from above. There must be a touch. There must be a penile. There must be the hand of God. Or you'll never make it above what you are. Born dust, die dust. Man and can never rise to what God's called us for. It takes the hand of the Lord to reach down and take hold and lift up from our circumstances. And first He's got to open the door. He's got to dispel the light. He's got to reach to the heart. He's got to get a hold of the soul. Or the soul will never know God. You'll never find Him. You'll never understand Him. You don't know where to look. You don't understand who He is. But when He begins to make Himself known and reveal Himself, then you take hold of him, and then you reach it, Peniel, and then you say, I will not turn you loose until you bless me. Have you ever been to Peniel? Have you ever come to that point in your life when you've given up on all of the garbage that you love, that you think you need, that you think is necessary, and come to the point when you say, Lord God, what is life? What is it about? What am I? Where am I going? What's the future? And the future is God. You were made far above a dog or a cat. There's a reason for you being in this world. He gave man his image. He made man to be raised up. What is man, he said, that thou art mindful of him or the son of man? What are we, my friend? The world says you're a dog. The world says you're an animal. The world said Darwin put his two cents worth in and says natural selection, survival of the fittest. But in the kingdom of God is that one that is broken. In the kingdom of God is that one in the greatest need. In the kingdom of God. 
God is that one that can't even raise their hand that for 38 years sits by a pool and said, I can't go, for there's no man to help me. Rise, he says. And in that word is the ability to rise above everything. It is the power of the Word of God. Amen. And so Jacob found himself at Peniel. He didn't choose Peniel. His life led him there. It wasn't something he sat down one day and charted out his life. You can't do that. Try it. It won't work. How many of you have lived long enough to understand? Sure, you make your plans. You've done this, said this, but it doesn't work that way. Life is not like that. Life is full of uncertainties. But there is one certain one. There is an anchor for the soul. There, my friend, is the Word of the living God that cannot be changed. How do you wrestle with God? At Peniel, Jacob wrestled with God. He wrestled with the angel. How do you wrestle with God? That's an oxymoron. Why, my goodness, friend, the almighty, eternal, absolute being from everlasting to everlasting, and we wrestle with Him, but you wrestle with His Word. You wrestle with His way. You wrestle with His will. You wrestle with the Spirit of the living God. We do it every day. Do you wrestle with God? But the Bible said in the book of Genesis 32 that He prevailed. Jacob prevailed. Would that be good for Jacob? He prevailed before. Every scheme he'd ever hatched up, he prevailed. Every lie he ever told, he managed to rise above it. Even with Laban, who changed his wages ten times, he said, he was still able to come out on top. So he's got to be brought down. How do you wrestle with God? How do you prevail with the Lord? Somebody said, well, now, preacher, what are you talking about? He wrestled with God. How did he prevail? over God. Well, God will allow you to understand it as you understand it now with the minds you have. With a fallen, frail, wicked, fleshly mind, a lot of you are listening to what I say. The fleshly mind. You've got to have the mind of Christ to be able to think better than what you think. Well, preacher, I've got all you sure you have. Oh, preacher, let me tell you something else. You don't even know your heart. There's only one that can really read your heart. And occasionally he'll let you get to the point where he begins to open your heart up so you can begin to read it. And then it's time to get on your knees. For you realize how holy he is and how unholy we are. Glory to God. But he's also gracious. Amen. As he begins to reveal the, reveal the human heart, the grace begins to flow. And it's there that he brings you into contact with him. It's there that you understand the greatness of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's there that the soul is fed by the presence of God and touched by his power. Oh, yes, wrestle with God, prevail with God, God will prevail. My friend, his way is not my way. God, how does he prevail, preacher? Well, he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Israel was born now. The prince with God leaves out upon Isle. He didn't immediately act like a prince with God. It took a while for Jacob to begin to understand who he was. And so it is with every one of us. All of a sudden, we don't become some super spiritual a Christian celebrity. It doesn't work that way. We walk with Him. We talk with Him. We commune with Him. We listen to Him. We stop talking. He starts talking. We take in instead of giving out. And then we begin to understand the truth of fellowship with Almighty God. Yes, the old man is a slave. <laughs> He's a slave. He just doesn't realize it. But the new man is free. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you're free indeed. The old man is taken captive by Satan at his will. But the new man is freed from the slavery of sin, given the power to overcome. Bars can't hold him. Lies can't keep him. Once a man is free, once that man is free inside his soul, he's a free man. He's been made free. How does God make a man free? How does all this happen, preacher? How does it work? In Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 16, he promised to the seed of the woman. From that moment on, every Jewish girl that was born considered and contemplated, could I be the one that have the seed of God placed in my soul? My friend, first of all, think of the fact that God would put his seed in a woman. My friend, here is something that's supernatural, something that's different. It can't be comprehended. It's got to be received by faith. It's got to be where they say, I 
understand. I believe it, but I don't understand it. And how could you if you had lived five, if you had lived, Moses wrote the Pentateuch 1,500 years before Christ. What if you'd been living 3,500 years ago and you'd heard that, that the seed of the woman, you'd say, well, I don't understand it, but I believe it. Well, that's me today. I have a lot of things I don't understand, but I believe them. Make no mistake about it. I believe that Bible. Glory to God. And so the seed of the woman. But the Bible begins to unfold for us. It begins to show us things. For example, even before Moses wrote it, Abraham lived it. For the Bible said he called him from Mary the Chaldees. And by faith, Abraham received the promise. That word promise begins to show up in the Bible. It sets for us a stream from Genesis to Revelation. It is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. It's one of those things that just jumps off the pages of the Scripture. The promise, the promise, the promise, the promise. Wait for the promise, the promise, the promise. And so the promise is given forth. But where did the promise come from? Where did it originate? It originated in the heart of God. And I'm going to tell you something right now, friend. A mind will never comprehend a heart. It takes a heart to touch a heart. It takes a heart to reach down into the depth of the soul of God. Oh, how He would have done more. How He would have said more. But a promise He gave. And Abraham was able to lift up his eyes to the heavens. He was able to receive that promise. My friend understand it. Didn't have to understand it. But he believed it. He received the promise of the Word of the living God. That promise he passed to his son Isaac. Isaac was a son of promise. Here are two old people, past, long past childbearing age, yet they bore children. They bore children because of the promise of God. The promise begins to take shape. We begin to understand there's something big about this promise. Then Isaac has a son, Jacob. And Jacob, my friend, the promise is transferred to. That promise is as real to Jacob as it was to Abraham. Then we fast forward all the way down to Mary. In the book of Luke, the Bible says when that angel showed up, chapter number 1 and verse number 38, to Mary, here's what he said. In Luke chapter number 1 and verse number 38, the Scripture says, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. She knew. Mary got a hold of it. Did you get this? Mary embraced something when she was impregnated that most of them around had no concept of. Be it unto me according to thy word. The promise was in the Word. And Mary received the Word. How in the world can a woman have seed? In the book of Galatians, we read something that's marvelous. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and thy seed which is Christ. My friend, if the Lord Jesus Christ had been the physical seed of Abraham, He would not have been the God-man. If the Lord Jesus Christ had been the physical seed of Abraham, He would not have been qualified to bear your sins at the cross as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. If the Lord Jesus Christ had been born physically of Abraham, there is no way in the world That Scripture could have been fulfilled in the sinless life of the Son of Man. So when it says seed, it must be referring to seed in another way. And it is. And in a powerful way. For the way the Scripture is talking about Abraham is that from Abraham our father, and he is your father, make no mistake about it, he's the father of every last one of us that believe. He's the father of the faithful. So how do you mean that, preacher? He gave birth to your faith. His faith gave birth to your faith. Now watch carefully. Watch carefully. By faith they all received the promise. The incarnation was in the promise. The promise became the reality of the God-man. And the Word brought forth the Word. That's how the seed of Abraham to this very day sitting at the right hand of the Father, that seed started by receiving faith 
in believing God. And that faith was transmitted from generation to generation to generation. And the last link in that transmission was Mary when she said, Be it unto me, unto thy handmaid, according to thy will. And the angel departed. That settled it. She received the seed of the Son of God into her womb, transmitted by faith. God became incarnate by faith. He chose humanity and said to the devil, they will believe. And God became a man. Do you believe? Do you believe that the word you heard this morning is far more powerful than your ability to comprehend, than your ability to change yourself, than your ability to do anything about it? If you simply act upon what you heard, act upon it, there's a point that your will is brought into play. Act upon it, and the word you receive begins to bring forth fruit and faith to believe. Would you do it? In Jesus' name I pray. Thy holy name I pray. Glorify thyself, Lord. In Jesus' sweet name I ask it. Would you come and say, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. I'll just be very honest with you, Lord. There's so many things in your word that I just don't understand. But I believe in you. And I believe in your goodness. And I believe in your mercy. And I believe you're able. Did you do that? Thy name, Father. Glorify thy name. Amen. Let's stand up. What have we got? Page 333 in your All American. Would you come? Maybe you've never been born again. You've never really been saved. Would you come? what David said, try me, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. He's asking God to try him. David was smart. He knew he couldn't try himself. He knew he couldn't. He could only see, see so much. He said, let you do it. You do it, Lord. Try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. You may get forgiveness for some thing you've done right now, some temporal sin now. And Satan will put your focus upon what you're doing. God puts your focus upon what you are. Satan is good at putting on band-aids. He's real good at it. Very good. He'll patch you up. He'll patch you all over the place. Make you feel good for a little while. But a band-aid's not what you need. You need a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of this death. You need an absolute profound change. And the only one that can do that is God. If you've tried everything that men tell you to try and it hadn't, hadn't worked, and we'll tell you why it won't work, because it originated with men. Just take God at His word. You must be born again. Sing another verse.
one more verse, brother. appreciate you listening to me. I thank the good Lord for being here with us this morning. I'm a messenger, folks, and that's all I am. It ends at that. I'm a messenger. The power is in God, and the power is in His Word, not me. We'll meet again this evening, Lord willing, at 6 o'clock for the evening service. Y'all keep that in mind. And Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we'll prayer meeting. Y'all keep that in mind. Caleb Wilson is going to be preaching Wednesday night. That's his first message here at Temple. Would you pray for him? Would you do that? Ask God to give him wisdom, unction, and the message that he wants us to hear. These young men come out like this and they start preaching the Word. You know, it's, I didn't call them. God does the calling. And uh, you just ask, uh, ask the good Lord when he calls, he equips. And uh, ask God to bless him now and be with him. If you'd like to come out Wednesday night, don't forget, don't, don't miss his first First uh, message here at Temple. He'll be here with us tonight, uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. So you all come out and support him and be here and be praying for him between now and Wednesday. Yes, He's got a little boy right over there uh, that God has, has raised up. God touched Jude. I firmly believe it. It looked awful dark for a while. It really did. And the doctors weren't given much. Apparently, they, I don't know what confusion was going on down there, but. When you're, getting, when you're scheduled to do something, then they cut it off, and then you have to go for weeks after that. Well, you know, that's frustrating. Uh, but that little boy's doing fine. He's doing fine. And his mama's doing good, too. His mama had a lot of problems, too, following that birth. And a lot of you prayed in here for them. You prayed for his mother, and you prayed for this little boy. You did. I know you did. We've got people that pray here at Temple. If we didn't have people that pray here at Temple, folks, this is just a performance. That's all this is. If you're not praying, you know. So they did. They prayed for them. And now I'm, I'm glad to see them healthy and their smiling faces. Well, now this, this man's going to stand up Wednesday night and preach. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> How do you think about that, Granddad? <laughs> I know you are, brother. <laughs> I know you are. Having prayer this afternoon, 5 o'clock, where you usually meet over here, don't you? Right here, yeah. Yeah, in this area over here. 5 o'clock this afternoon. You'll never pray too much. You can do a lot of other things too much. You'll never pray too much. Pastor, could I, could I ask um, that the church be praying? Um, my attorney boss passed away yesterday.